I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In the last episode of Journey Through the Scriptures, we began a study of the first letter of the Apostle John, who started following Jesus as a son of thunder and ended his ministry as the Apostle of Love. John's letter was about the basics of faith in Christ. It helped his readers look honestly at their faith. It helped them answer the question, Am I a true believer? John told them that they could tell by looking at their actions, and that real and authentic Christianity is always made up of the same three elements, truth, righteousness, and love. The third theme that John deals with is love. The word love, loves, and beloved, all forms of the root word agape, is mentioned 51 times in the letter of 1 John. Regarding truth and righteousness, it might be easy for Christians to admit and say, Yes, it is true. We've got to teach the truth, obey the truth, and believe the truth about Christ. And of course, we've got to stop doing the things the world is doing. But that is as far as they go. I have heard many testimonies of Christians saying that, I used to smoke and drink and gamble and sleep around and all these terrible things, but I don't do any of these anymore. I believe in the Lord. I've stopped all these things. This gives the impression that these actions would make anyone become a Christian. The problem, however, is that people are not the least bit impressed by what you have stopped doing. Non-believers can stop doing any of these things if they have a good enough reason. If this is the basis of your Christian testimony, then you have got nothing more to say than they do. I worked with someone many years ago who would often confront people who were trying to impress her by telling her how busy they were. She used to say, don't tell me how busy you are, show me. I think that John is saying the same thing here in 1 John 3 verses 16. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. What does impress unbelievers is seeing us do something they cannot do. And that is love. That is why John says that the third mark of a genuine Christian is that he begins to love. Not those that love him, that is easy but beginning to love those who do not love you, by treating kindly those who mistreat you, repaying evil with good and praying for those who maliciously abuse you, and welcoming and treating kindly those who are against you and are trying to hurt you. Remember what Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You no longer treat those who have needs around you with heartless indifference, but you respond to them and do not shut them out of your life. 1 John 4 verses 20 says, If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. John is very practical in his teachings. He emphasizes that fellowship with the Lord Jesus, a day-by-day -day walk with him, allowing ourselves to be changed by the power of Christ. This will result in the truth about Jesus' righteousness manifesting in our personal behavior and love towards our brothers and our fellow members of the human race as well as those fellow members of the Church of God. John teaches that biblical love is a sign of being born of God and knowing God. He states emphatically that believers are to show their love for God by loving one another. John says the following in chapter 4 verses 7 to 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. 
Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest to us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but he loved us and sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Love not only demonstrates God's presence in our lives, it serves as evidence to the rest of the world. Love is how the world is meant to see God, even though they cannot see him physically. Anyone who claims to love God should naturally prove it by loving his brother. John repeatedly emphasizes the fact that a person cannot claim to love God, yet hate others. In chapter 3 verses 15, John makes it clear that hate always has a demonic source. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Those who hate are not abiding in Christ. The Greek word for abiding is menousan, and this has the deeper meanings of continuing to be present, to remain as one, and to not become another or not becoming different. Believers are children of God and brothers and sisters of one another. As family, they are to love one another according to the commandment of God. In 1 John 4 verses 18, Love is contrasted with fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. This gives us an insight into the relationship between love and fear. What John is saying here is that godly love and worldly fear are incompatible. God's perfect love drives out the apprehension of being accepted by him. Other places in scripture speak of fearing God as a sense of awe, respect or trembling before him. However, here John's focus is on anxiety over whether or not God does truly love and forgive us. Believers who followed God's example of love have no reason to fear that God will not accept them. His perfect love removes the need of this fear. God is love, shows perfect love and places his love in the hearts of those who believe. In chapter 5, the last part of the letter, John focuses on assurance. With a great, caring, fatherly love, John is concerned that Christians should be sure that they are Christians, and so he tells them how to examine themselves in two areas. If we just glance at verses 13 to 21, you will see the word no appear many times. In verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you might know that you have eternal life. In verse 15, And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. In verse 18, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. In verse 19, We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And in verse 20, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son Jesus Christ. The word know appears 39 times in this letter, and seven of those times are in this last section. Our faith is not based on hope. It is grounded on knowing. God has spoken, and what God has spoken is true. Therefore, if we know what he has said, then we know what is true. We don't have to speculate. We can have assurance. But how can we know? John says in 1 John 5 verses 13 to 15, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. John wrote this letter 
and states in verse 13 that you may know that you have eternal life. We can measure ourselves against the tests. Do we believe in Jesus Christ? Do we understand our own sinful condition? Are we manifesting the evidence of a transformed life by the character of our love for God, our love for others, our hatred towards the things of this world, and by manifestation of our obedience? If we pass those tests, we will know that we have eternal life. That is assurance. The word confidence appears in verse 14. That confidence is based on what we know in verse 13. And what do we know? We know that if God hears, we know He will answer. We know we have eternal life, but before this is realized, when we die and are united with Him in heaven, that we still have all these needs and concerns and issues and struggles and temptations, we know that God answers our prayers. This is the confidence that we have. The word translated here as confidence is parousia. It means boldness and literally translates as the freedom to speak. We have a boldness, a freedom to go before the Lord on any issue and freely and boldly ask. Hebrews 4 verses 16 says the same thing. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Our confidence then is not only in the life to come, our confidence is in the here and now that we have access to God. We might not yet be in His presence and entered into our eternal inheritance, but we now have access to all of God's resources through means of prayer. And that is what John is saying. This is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. We have the assurance and boldness as believers to go right into the presence of the eternal God and boldly and freely ask for what we need. And if we ask anything according to His will, verse 15 assures us what God's response will be. And if we know that He listens to our requests, we can be sure that we have what we ask Him for. Hearing is answering for God. There is only one qualifier, according to His will. And we have the confidence that our prayers will be answered. If we return back to chapter 3 verses 21, we will see that John has said it already. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. If our hearts are right and our conscience is clear, we have confidence to go before God and then verse 22 provides us with that answer and the results of our confidence. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him, and that we believe in the name of His Son Jesus Christ, and love one another. So, if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and keep His commandments, we can ask whatever we want, and we will receive it. We have confidence or assurance before God that we will receive what we ask for. Once a believer has an assurance of fellowship with God, they can have tremendous confidence to start each day knowing that they are a child of God. This confidence is shown in their attitude towards God. They can ask in the name of Jesus for anything, knowing that God is able and willing to respond. This will also give the believer the confidence to speak more boldly to others. I am not advocating the name it and claim it heresy of the word of faith movement, God answers the believer's prayer by His grace, not by obligation. His promises are not things we own, but are things we trust Him to do in His way, in His time. Faith is trust in an almighty, loving God, not a power imparted to us. 1 John, and all of Scripture, tells us that we know that what God has told us is true. We know that what He has revealed about the world is true. We have a continually growing certainty that determines our lives. John's closing statements in chapter 5 verses 18 says, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. This is righteousness. We know, John says in verse 19, that we are of God. 
the very nature and being of God, the God who is love, and that the whole world is in the power of the evil one. That is why non-believers cannot love. They can want it and talk about it and search for it, but they cannot find it because God is love and they have no relationship or fellowship with him. 1 John 5.20 says, We know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. What a wonderful declaration this is in an age of relativism when everybody is telling us that we cannot know anything for sure, that nobody knows anything for certain. John says that we do. We know and we have an assurance because we have been given an understanding. John closes his letter with this final warning. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Again, the tender fatherly love of this old apostle emerges. John is no longer the son of thunder. He is now the apostle of love, and his final statement shows us the love and passion he has for all believers. John is saying in this last statement, do not go after something else. Whatever you give your attention to, whatever holds your interest, takes your time, energy, and money, that is what you live for, and that is your God. Is it Jesus Christ, or is it something else? Throughout modern-day Greece, Italy and Turkey are found the ruins of ancient temples where a certain god or goddess had been worshipped. There were temples dedicated to the worship of Apollo, Venus, Zeus, Artemis and others, but all have been abandoned and are now just heaps of stones and only a tourist curiosity. But the worship of gods has not ceased. We still have the same gods. We have changed the names, but the gods and the idols are exactly the same. There is one legend about a beautiful youth in Greek mythology who fell in love with his own reflection and was turned into a narcissus flower, also known as the daffodil. This is the current god of mankind, the worship of self, the worship of man, the exaltation of man, essentially narcissism. We are told that man is so tremendous, so smart and clever, and that he can do so many things, but we deny the glaring evidence that the world is crumbling to pieces around us, and man has really done nothing. John writes and warns us as believers not to be led off into the same worship that the world around us is constantly engaged in. This idolatry will destroy us, as it will rob us of what God has for us in Christ. Jesus declared in Matthew 22 verses 37 that the first and greatest commandment is, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. That is the purpose of man. And idolatry is loving something else as God. What is an idol? It is a substitute God. Your God is what you get excited about, what you save your money for, and what you spend it on. What is important to you? That is your God. This last verse of 1 John might be God's last word to mankind. It is probable that these letters of John are possibly the last of the New Testament to be written and perhaps are the last words we have from the apostles. God's first statement to us is, In the beginning God created, and among his last words to us is this, Keep yourselves from idols. The message translates this verse as, Dear children, be on guard against all clever facsimiles. But if I can put it in simple terms, God's final word to us, from the pens of the apostles, is perfectly summed up in the translation of the Living Bible. Dear children, keep away from anything that may take God's place in your hearts. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 13.